Hello and welcome to the first lecture in our unit on the state. In this lecture, we're going to talk about what the state is exactly. We're going to do this because it's often the concept we're trying to explain or evaluate in comparative politics. So as we talked about in our last lectures on research methods, it's very important that we have a very precise definition in order to apply the scientific method. We'll begin by talking about what the state is not, because it has a lot of other meanings in the English language that aren't what we're talking about in comparative politics. We'll then move to talking about what the state is exactly, and then we'll talk about some of the many things that states do. We will conclude by talking about why we have a state in the first place. So, let's look at some formal definitions out of textbooks. One holds that a, a state is a set of ongoing institutions that develops and administers laws and generates and implements public policies in a specific territory. A lot going on there. Here's another one also with a lot going on. A state is a political legal unit with sovereignty over a particular geographic territory and the population that resides in that territory. All right, here's a, a nice and simple one. A state is the standing institutions of political authority. So there are lots of things going on here. It's an institution, a political, legal unit. There's a territorial aspect. And indeed, some of the really crucial aspects of the modern state are that it has territory, sovereignty, legitimacy, a bureaucracy, and a certain kind of authority. So we will tackle all of these one by one in a moment. But first, let's take a quick look at what the state does not mean when we're using it in the context of comparative politics. The first is that it is not an American state. So in comparative politics, when we talk about the state, we're talking about something at more of a country level. So we're not talking about California or Ohio or Michigan. Next, we're not talking about a nation. And this is a pretty easy thing to get mixed up. Basically, a nation is a group of people who feel that they share a common culture. So first of all, a nation deals with a group of people, while a state is some sort of political unit. A nation is subjectively defined. So while a state is legally based, a nation can be based on a lots, of, lots of different things, and it's based on culture, which is inherently subjective. So you could have nations based on language, religion, ethnicity, different customs, dresses, foods, a shared history. But the bottom line with a nation is that it's a sense of a shared identity and a shared background, so a perceived sameness that a group of people has. Nations and states don't always occupy the same boundaries. Uh, we don't actually think about this all the time in America because America is a rare state where American and the state of America have the same boundaries. But there are a lot of cir circumstances where this isn't the case. For example, there are many nations without states. Here we have the example of Kurdistan. Now the Kurds are a nation, they're a group of people who feel themselves to be similar to one another and different from other groups of people, but they don't have their own state. You can see this is where the Kurds would like Kurdistan to be. It takes up portions of Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. Obviously Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria do not want Kurdistan to exist, while the Kurds living as a minority in each of these countries do. And indeed, you can see that in the area that the Kurds would like to turn into Kur Kurdistan, they are a majority with that dark green indicating that they are 60 to 100 percent of the population. Another common disconnect between states and nations is a situation in which states have multiple nations within them. Now, this can become a very important political issue because it raises the problem of who gets to be the boss within the state. If there are multiple nations, as is the case within Libya, where there are three distinct nations living within the same political boundaries. Following the struggle against Colonel Gaddafi, a lot of people have wondered what kind of government will emerge in Libya. Will it be a government that all three nationalities living within the state will be happy with? Here's a map with the various ethnicities and nationalities of Russia. And this might be surprising to many people who, when they think of Russia, just think that it's filled with Russians. But there are actually hundreds of nations living within the boundaries of the state of Russia. And this can cause great conflict. You may have heard of struggles in Georgia and in Chechnya and in the Caucasus. And these are often caused by the disconnect between the state and the nations. Another couple of terms that are conceptually distinct from the idea of the state is the government or the administration. 
So in America, we talk about administrations. We talk about the Obama administration or the Bush administration, while in many parliamentary democracies, they'll talk about governments. So in the United Kingdom, they'll talk about the government of David Cameron or Tony Blair. But what all of this has in common is these are the actual people, a group of people who does the state's business. They rule in the name of the state. But while the state is a very long-term phenomenon or entity, the governments or administrations come and go with each election or revolution. And finally, we'll make a distinction between states and regimes. The term regime refers to a type of political organization within the state. So examples of this might be democracy, dictatorship, or theocracy. We'll return to this much more in the future. Now it's time to talk about what a state actually is. So one really basic and important thing about states is that they have boundaries. They are territorial units. So you might remember one of those textbook definitions talking about how the state is a territorial political unit that rules the people living in that territory. So this is the first element that we'll concern ourselves with. The next important attribute of the modern state that we'll talk about is that states are sovereign. Indeed, you've probably heard the term the sovereign state. And what sovereignty means is that states are the sole authority. They're kind of like Cartman. States demand that their citizens respect their authority, and sovereignty entails that states can kind of do what they want within their boundaries. Or, as a very influential German sociologist named Max Weber put it best, states have a monopoly on the legitimate use of physical force within their territory. So basically what this means is it's, it's not that there's no other violence or use of physical force within the state, but the state is the only entity that's use of that violence is legitimate. So if a criminal shoots someone, that's a crime. But if a cop shoots somebody in the line of duty, that's the state at work and that's the cop doing her job. We can think of two kinds of sovereignty. The first is internal sovereignty. And this basically means they're the sole authority within the territory capable of making and enforcing laws. And this means that the leadership of the state can effectively make laws and that there are some sort of institutions that can carry out laws like a court system or capable police force. This also means that there are no other claims to power within the state. So if you're the king, there aren't three or four other kings in your territory claiming the same territory or parts of that territory as their own. It means that there are no rebel groups. So here you see a picture of the FARC, which is a, a very infamous rebel group in Colombia that claims pieces of the Colombian territory as their own. The next kind of sovereignty is external sovereignty. External sovereignty refers to being free from external interference. So it means that your borders are secure and people aren't able to invade. It means that you're able to defend yourself. And it also means that your government makes the state's laws, not somebody else. So you're not a puppet state. Additionally, a state with external sovereignty is legally recognized by international law. This means that other states see them as the sovereign within their boundaries, and they can do things like take part in the United Nations negotiations or go to international court. So that's sovereignty. Another important element of the state is that it is legitimate. Legitimacy entails that people within and outside of the state recognize the state's sovereignty. There's some aspect of the state convincing others that it is who should it is the entity that should actually rule that territory. And this goes back to Max Weber's definition of the state of being a monopoly on the legitimate use of physical force. So the bottom line here is that a great majority of people within the state need to see the state's functioning and existence as legitimate. And this can happen in three ways. First is traditional or patrimonial legitimacy. So here we see a picture of the British royal family. And indeed, traditional or patrimonial legitimacy comes from bloodlines or divine right or some sort of familial inheritance that people should rule. Now, this is not seen as very legitimate anymore in the world. But for a long period of human history, rule by traditional legitimacy was the norm. Here's charismatic legitimacy, the second type. And here's a picture of Eva Perón. She was a very famous first woman in Argentina, and she was known for being able to really whip up a crowd. And indeed, charismatic 
legitimacy is based on charisma. It's the ability of a leader to attract support and to be seen as legitimate and sovereign because they're able to speak well, use rhetoric well, well and make promises. The third kind is rational bureaucratic, and this is the most modern kind. And the crux of rational bureaucratic legitimacy is that people see authority as depersonalized. So it's not tied to the queen or to a really convincing speaker. Instead, it's based on a bureaucracy that is based upon appointment, and the state's activities are restricted to certain tasks and areas that are set by law. So this is sort of the more modern way. Now. In practice, legitimacy tends to work as a mix of all three of these. So while most modern democratic governments are based primarily on rational bureaucratic legitimacy, there's obviously an element of charismatic legitimacy in democratic elections. Now that we have spent considerable time thinking about what the state is and is not, let's briefly think about what the state does. And the first and obvious thing that the state does is that it rules. We talked about how states are sovereign, which means they are the sole authority within a territory, and that involves doing things like making laws. Not only do they rule, but they coerce. So thinking back on Max Weber's definition, in which states are said to have a monopoly on the legitimate use of force, states coerce where their rule is defied. States also provide. They do things like have militaries to provide protection of their populaces. They build schools and universities to educate their populaces, and they build things like parks and playgrounds to improve the quality of life, and then they provide basic infrastructure from water to sewage to roads. But of course, none of this comes free, and states also extract, and by extract we mean take, and by take we mean taxes. And extraction is a really important part of what it means to be a state. Indeed, we'll talk about this in future lectures, but some political scientists actually measure the strength or quality of a state by the amount that it extracts. So that's a little bit about what states do. Now let's conclude by briefly considering why we have a state in the first place. And what we will suggest to you is that we have states to provide public goods and to overcome collective action problems that we face in providing those public goods. So a public good is something good that we all want. And the public part of this term is that it's a good that is not excludable. One person can't hoard it all or use it all. So we're thinking things like safe bridges or clean air and clean water. I can't just take all the clean air and keep you from having any. It's a public good. And there are two broad classes of public goods. There's minimal, so these are basic things like security. And then there are maximal public goods things like education and health care. And we run into a collective action problem when we're trying to think about public goods. And a collective action problem is essentially a situation in which there's a disconnect between the group and individual interests. And usually what it is is that group interests are such that everybody benefits. Everybody gets a public good when lots of people participate. But individually, the members of the group are better off if they can somehow get out of participating, because participating usually means giving some of your own resources. So this is the tension between the state's provision of public goods on one hand, and the fact that state citizens must contribute to the provision of these public goods. So think of it this way. When it comes to taxes, it's really ideal if you can work it out so that everyone else pays taxes so that you get to enjoy fresh water from the tap and a subsidized education in Ohio State, but get out of paying taxes yourself. So you benefit if everybody else in society pays taxes, but somehow you get out of it. So individually, it's great to free ride, but uh, a state is in a really bad situation if none of its citizens pay taxes. This is the problem of free riding. A free rider is someone who gets the benefits without paying the cost. So it's like these guys who are getting where they want to go but getting out of paying for it. In terms of the state, we'll tend to think of this in terms of getting public goods but not paying taxes. But there, this is a, a very diverse problem. You can probably think of lots of ways it applies just in everyday life. The state overcomes free rider problems by making rules. You have to pay taxes. You cannot pollute. That's how the state provides the public goods. And the state, going back to Max Weber's definition, uses coercion. So if you try and ride for free on a train, you have to deal with this guy, and he's going to charge you a fee. And a really broad way to think about this was introduced by a 
philosopher and political theorist named Thomas Hobbes in his book, The Leviathan. And now in The Leviathan, Thomas Hobbes says that we all have a collective action problem because we're all self-interested. And the collective action problem is that individually, we all want to do whatever we want, even if that means hurting each other physically. But we also all benefit if we live in a secure environment because the flip side of being able to hurt whoever you want to get whatever it is you want is that you also could be the victim. So Hobbes asks us to think of a state of nature. And this is a situation in which people just run free. It's total anarchy. There's no society and no state. And Thomas Hobbes famously called this a nasty, brutish, and short life. This is a dog-eat-dog, backstabbing existence. And existence in the state of nature is truly terrifying. And so according to Hobbes, what we willfully do to escape from the state of nature is construct what he calls the Leviathan. Now, a Leviathan is a biblical sea creature that is very powerful and very scary. And for Hobbes, the Leviathan we construct is the state. So basically, we give up a little bit of our individual liberty, the kind of liberty that says, I can go do whatever I want and hurt whoever I want, in exchange for a secure and ordered situation. And that means that we need to have this big, scary Leviathan monster, the state, to enforce those laws. And this state, or Leviathan, is the great enforcer, and it overcomes this very basic collective action problem that we want to live in a secure environment. So the most basic public good just being freedom from fear, freedom from violence. So here is the cover of Thomas Hobbes' book, Leviathan. And as you can see, for Hobbes writing in the 1600s, the Leviathan, the state, is a king. And if we look closely, we can see that king is made up of people. So this is the idea of the state as this big overarching organization ruling over the land. And obviously, this involves trade-offs. We give up some of our liberty for social order, but that means we have to draw a line somewhere. We have to choose between liberty and social order. And what is the right mix? The extent of the state is going to be a fundamental theme in our course. Some people want the state to solve more problems than others. Some see the state as the source of all the problems in the first place. People at both ends of the spectrum have good arguments to make, and ultimately it's about the kind of society we want to live in and the inherent trade-offs involved. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about these trade-offs and where we should draw those lines, but not today. That's all for now. Good luck with your readings and good luck with the quizzes. See you next time.